And now to tonight's keynote speaker. Uh, his Twitter profile notes that he is studying, teaching, and making games in Salt Lake City. Lots of love for kitties, the color orange, lasers, and hobos. His LinkedIn profile self-proclaims that he's a video game educator, researcher, creator, and my favorite part, an occasional player, uh, which I'm sure is uh, great for Sam. Um, Roger Altizer has been very much the public face of the Master Game Studio at the EAE program at the University of Utah. He's been a staunch advocate of gaming in Utah and the practical applications of using this entertainment medium for learning and social benefit. Roger has inspired many students in the award-winning program that he helped to create, challenging their assumptions and pushing them to achieve more than perhaps they believe possible. In addition, he's been a terrific partner for those of us in industry locally. And to make things worse, he's actually a nice guy. Uh, he has a weakness for convertibles, pedicures, Hawaiian shirts, and ill-advised headwear. Uh, what else can I say about Roger that he hasn't already said? So please join me in welcoming one of the brightest stars in Utah's digital educational universe, Sir Roger Altizer. Roger. You're going to make me blush. You're going to make me blush. All right, so um, before we get started here today, um, and I introduce myself, I, I think it's important to actually introduce the team um, from EAE. So Entertainment Arts and Engineering is a team effort, and it's a, it's a team comprised of lots of talented people at the university. You see us all wearing the same shirts, um, and it's the students, the faculty, the admin, the staff, and the local industry that makes all of the great stuff we've done um, possible. But in all of this, you'll always know who I am. All right, so, um, so who am I, right? So I'm one of the co-founders of the Entertainment Arts and Engineering program. I came from games industry. I was a games journalist for about a decade before I ever taught anything about games. And these days, I collect titles. So I am the Associate Director of Entertainment Arts and Engineering. Um, I'm Director of the Therapeutic Games and Apps Lab. Um, I'm an Associate Professor of Population Health Sciences. Um, I, I'll figure out what that means someday and tell you. Um, and, and I'm sure there's some other things that people call me behind my back as well. Um, the Gap Lab, really briefly, because I'm not going to talk much about this tonight, but it's a huge part of my work. We have about 35 graduate students, all of whom are receiving scholarships to work on medical games and apps and serious games. Um, so what this means is they're working on all sorts of grant-funded mechanisms. Um, the Natural History Museum has paid them to make two games. As you walked in, there was a bench you walked by, and there's a cool game in there that helps kids discover the museum. And that was made by students at the University of Utah. So, uh, so it's a great program. It does all sorts of fun things for and with students. All right, so one of the things that we frequently get asked in EAE is um, you make this claim that you're the number one games program in the nation. Um, and what do you base that on, right? And, and the answer is there are a few different people out there that rank games programs, and one of them is the Princeton Review. And the Princeton Review has ranked us as the number one games program in the nation multiple times, right? Um, in the early days, back in 07 when we first got started, there was only about 50 programs in the nation. And now that number is well over 500, right? And so you can see where it says UG, that's our undergraduate program, and grad is our graduate program. So, um, and, and we've also got to plug uh, the mystery escape room while we're here, right? If you haven't gotten a chance to do that yet, you should go do that. Um, it's an incredible local business. And one of our students is a co-founder. So uh, we got in for free, it was pretty slick. All right, so who else is on this list, right? People always ask this kind of question. And there are a lot of great schools on this list. We always consider them colleagues and not competitors, even when they don't return the favor. Um, but, you know, and students always go, what school should I go to? And I say, you know, you, you pick the one that has the letters that you like the best, and it's probably a good call. Um, but really, all of these schools specialize in different things. They do great things. Um, and schools like USC and uh, SMU and University of Central Florida always are at the top of this list as well. Um, NYU is a new games program and a rising star in this field. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of good company here. So I still haven't answered the question that, well, how do we get these kind of rankings and what do they actually mean, right? So let's talk about how. All right, so last year was a banner year for us. We had 96% of our students employed from the graduate program within six months of graduation. 80% of those in games, right? Now, that is a, a sort of a, an anomaly year for us, right? Normally, that's about 1%, right? And then the rest of them all complain. Now, we're always up around that 70% number, so we always do pretty well. Um, and those people go everywhere from Microsoft in Seattle all the way to EA Tiburon down in Florida, right? And everywhere in between. A lot of students staying locally and doing cool stuff. Some of them in this room, it's good to see you all. Um, 
And so that's one of the things that sort of makes a big difference. They also look at who's teaching the classes, how many people have PhDs, how many industry people are teaching. We have about a third of our classes taught by industry people. It's something we're pretty proud of. Um, and you know, and what kind of things do they do? They want to know what kind of stuff you have. Do you have 3D printers and scanners and that kind of thing, right? And are you doing anything interesting? So I'm going to brag about this real quick. We're going to be one of the first people in the nation, and we think we are the first, to have a joint MBA games program. So starting next year, you'll be able to roll in the Master uh, of Entertainment Arts and Engineering program and at the same time get your MBA, meaning that you could work in analytics, right, and that whole game analytics thing. Or if you're an entrepreneur, you could chase that route as well. Or if you just don't want to ever graduate, this is a great option for you. <laughs> um, our alumni are probably the key to our success. They do phenomenal things. Um, the best, they're our single greatest resource in terms of networking and getting all sorts of fun people, fun jobs. Um, and they, they won awards when they were in school and after school, and that really helps us out a lot as well. Um, and then, of course, research projects and funding is a big thing for us. We do anywhere from about 750 to $1.3 million a year in games-related research. I mean, it takes all sorts of different forms, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight, so it should be fun. All right, so what does games education look like and what's our particular twist on this thing, right? We've done something that we think is kind of unique and kind of special. We, uh, we divide our education into three things, right? We have these academic classes. They're the classes that you know and love. You either you know, raised your hand a lot, you fell asleep, you flirted. There were lots of ways of being a student, right? But those are probably the classes that you're most familiar with. Professor standing up in the front and talking to you, right? Um, our industry experience classes are a different type of class. Those are usually taught by an industry professional, and we do them for a couple of reasons. We are very honest in the fact that faculty's skills can atrophy, right? It has been a long time. And if somebody wanted to learn how to do something in Flash, I'm your guy. But um, I don't know that it's useful to learn Flash anymore, being that it's not supported, right? So the way we keep on top of that is a lot of our skills are taught by industry professionals who are actively working in the industry. Keeps us agile, keeps us on top of things. But more importantly is the socialization skill. It's almost like an apprenticeship model. You learn from people that are doing, right? And you get to talk to them about how they do it. Not just what they do on a daily basis and what software they use or what programs they use, but how do you go about being a working programmer? How do you go about being a producer? Hanging out with one is one of the best ways to find out in our mind. And then we're very project driven. You saw one of our projects, Reload 360. It's an excellent student game. And in our projects classes, it's really, um, the games are important, but what we're really wanting are soft skills there. Can you work on a team, right? And we work on very large teams, 14-person teams, um, lots of fun drama, you know, it, it's pretty good. And we try and coach them through that kind of stuff, right? And you'll get some examples of that fun stuff here in a minute. So the other key to our success is that we publish the students' games, right? And that's something that's kind of unique in, uh, in education. So we sort of realized one day that our students are actually really kind of making games, right? Like, like this, this guy here, he made this game where you use a plastic guitar controller to make a person move around and jump up and down and punch people they apparently don't like in the face, right? All to the beat of the music. Um, and it was a great pitch. The pitch was, um, this is before the recent Guitar Hero, there were 25 million plastic guitars sitting under people's uh, couches and beds and things like that after the fall of Rock Band and Guitar Hero. We should do something with those, right? And so they made a game. And we went, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, it's kind of a neat game. Oh, it'd be great if the world got to see it and you'd probably learn something in the process, right? So our students make games and we get them out there. But we weren't the first people to think about this, right? Other people have games and they make them and they get out there as well. This is Super Daryl Deluxe, right? It's made from a, a school as far away as you can get in Rochester in New York, right? Um, it did great. It won all sorts of fantastic awards. Awards from Intel and awards from Microsoft and awards from Taco Bell, right? That's how you know you've arrived because it puts you in good company, right? Lots of great games are associated with Taco Bell. All right, so, uh, and, and again, we're not, we're not always the first in this, right? We've seen that it's worked elsewhere. This is a game called Flow. You may or may not be familiar with it, right? It was a big title on the PlayStation 3. Sort of taught you how to use their six-axis controller. It was a controller with a gyroscope in it, right? This was a master's thesis project made by Genova Chen at USC. And um, his tenacity and his faculty's tenacity got them appointments with Sony Santa Monica, and then, long story short, it's on the PlayStation. Um, and that allowed you to get games like Flower and eventually games like Journey as well. So it's sort of this whole thing about getting student games out there has changed the way indie games get made um, and opened up a lot of really cool opportunities. So we sort of said, hey, you know, we can do that. We're going to go with that, right? 
Um, we also know that this is a huge industry. Like the ESA predictions are something like that games in 2018 are going to be bigger than film, music, and the military combined. And this is measured in hundreds of trillions of dollars, right? Uh, this is a total lie, right? You've got to laugh at this because this is nowhere near true, right? They, they, nothing's going to trump military spending. But it, is a <laughs> but it is a growing industry, right? And so it is, a, it is something that we want to see more and more games get into, and people are actually looking for more and more content to be published, right? We see all sorts of new platforms evolving every day. This is sort of the golden age for making games. It has never been easier than now to get a game out to the public and actually turn revenue off of that game. And you know, we're seeing all sorts of new players in this space as well, right? So, uh, you know, coming soon near you. All right, so what does that mean to publish games? Well, here's 30 games that we've published, right? All of these are games that were made by students. The idea originated with students and was developed as part of a class, right? All 30 of these games are team-based games with artists and engineers and all sorts of other cool folk working together, right? And all of them have been released somewhere. That could be on the Xbox, that could be on the PlayStation Mobile, it could be on a phone, it could be on Steam, right? But they've all seen that last 10%. It's that last 10% that you normally don't get to see in school. When you write a paper for a professor, it's frequently not good enough to publish in a magazine, right? When you make a movie for a film faculty member, it's frequently not good enough to submit to Sundance. We ask that our students go that extra 10%, and they do, and they do it well. Um, so this is our games for 2016, and we have some incredible games. You've already seen Reload 360. It's one of the master's student games. Um, the very dark game up in the top right, that game is called Best. It's the most humble game that has ever been made. Um, and it's a police trainer for de-escalation, right? And they've won some awards and gotten some press, and they're doing really well. They teamed up with the Void, and they're doing all sorts of fun stuff, right? Um, but we've got all sorts of great games, like Dive Star Path is a cool game where you sort of run around planets, or actually you fly around planets dodging asteroids. And Tentacult was a, uh, actually shown at GDC, um, in the Intel Showcase, right? The Intel Student Showcase. So they went to San Francisco, they showed off their games, Intel hired some of them, so you know, it worked out pretty well for them to have their game published. Um, this is the most games that we've ever published in one year. And if you think about it, I don't know of anyone in town who is publishing this many games in one year. In fact, this might make us the single largest game publisher on the planet. Um, <laughs> but I, I'd have to Google that to be sure, right? <laughs> All right, so we are the one and only school to run a, uh, a games publishing company, right? Um, and the way that we do it, we actually have our own company. We have the Utah Game Forge, right? And it's something that students can choose to publish in, right? Um, but usually, they choose to make their own companies. So while the, at Utah, we have a company that they can use, that they can opt into, they do their own work. And this is important to us. We fought really hard to make sure that students own their own IP that these are their games and not our games. Now, if a student doesn't want to publish these things, they can use our mechanism, right, and sign over some of their rights to the university. We tried to make that as liberal as possible for them. All right, so there are a couple of things that happen when you publish a game, and I can guarantee pretty much every one of these things is true. And I'll give you an example of a game, and then you, know, and then you can assume if you want to publish a game or encourage a young person to publish a game, it'll also be true for them and or you, all right? So you get the Roger Altizer 100% guarantee with each one of these statements. All right, so first of all, every game is going to generate buzz, right? Um, that's a guarantee. All right, uh, so, so Erie did. Erie was one of our games made by our first cohort of master students, one of whom is now faculty, Ryan Baum, was one of the leads on that project. Um, it did really well because it got picked up by PewDiePie, right? So because of that, it's got over 10 million YouTube views and hundreds of thousands of downloads. And when we interview people from around the world, they say, oh, yeah, that's that school where Erie came from. And I totally pretend like I had something to do with it, right? Um, and this is true for every single game that's ever made, right? If you've ever made a game, you know that it's going to be popular. These things, these things are not true. These aren't true statements. Um, all right, so every game is popular, right? Again, guaranteed. Um, all is Dust was a popular game. This was a game that was released last year. It is a survival horror game that's both a VR game and a non-VR game, right? So you can play it on the regular PC. And it's a, it's a horror game set in the Dust Bowl. So think of like the scariest version of the Grapes of Wrath, and then you've got this game, right? Um, and again, hundreds of thousands of downloads in a relatively short amount of time. Um, and that's true. Every single one of our games has had at least dozens of downloads, right? <laughs> so it's, it's, an, it's another one of the guarantees, right? Every game makes bank, 100% guaranteed. 
If you've ever made a game, you know that you don't need to be here, right? Like you're like, you're here because you just want to share your wealth and be, you know, be that person, right? Um, some of them do. So we've had games make tens of thousands of dollars, right? And this was an undergraduate student game that did that. Um, and some of our games have uh, made, uh, um, you know, they've been sold for free 99. So they did pretty well as well. Um, you know, they did okay. But so why do we really do this kind of stuff? It's because they get real skills out of this experience. And it sort of is uh, one, of our, one of our hallmarks. So they learn things like teamwork. Working, working on a large team is not easy. Working on an interdisciplinary team is even harder. And working on a creative project where everyone in the team has equal ownership in that project is a nightmare, right? And we visit this nightmare on our students every year. Um, they also learn cross-cultural collaboration. So because they're either artists and engineers working together, or a full third of our students to half of our students, depending on the year, are international students. And so there are all sorts of great things that they learn from working together. They learn leadership. Seeing these projects through is not easy. And they get all sorts of fun new learning opportunities. And I want to talk about one of them right now. All right, so we had a game that did really well. Um, and it made a lot of money. And the students were all very happy. One student registered the name or the game in their name. And you know, got tens of thousands of dollars from Microsoft for this game. That student was super ethical. They just put the money in a pile and they divided it all up like in a bank heist movie and everyone walked off with their equal shares, right? And we were all happy and took pictures and it was a very exciting moment. And then April the next year came around, right? And this student owed like a lot of money to the IRS because their income went through the roof because of the proceeds from this game, right? And so we, 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 had, we had not thought about this in advance. I got to be honest with this one, right? So we did not know. We did not see this coming. And the student said, well, what do we do? And we came up with this great plan of ask for some of it back, right? And surely this is going to be a great plan. And it worked. Almost everyone gave money back. Um, one of the students that was really reluctant to do it. It wasn't reluctant. It, he was lost. He was in Vietnam for a year backpacking. And so it was hard to track him down to get the money, right? And I think that's a reasonable excuse. So, you know, you learn valuable soft skills like, you know, cover your taxes in advance, right? So what are some of the real life skills they learn? So teamwork, right? They learn great things there and that's good stuff that they learn, right? And cross-cultural collaboration, right? Then you find out that international students can be deported um, if they own companies. We learned that, that was a good thing to learn. Um, you know, and you also learn that you have to do a lot of groveling when you don't know, actually know what you're doing when it comes to business, right? So uh, and it leads to all sorts of other new learning opportunities for our students as well. And students love this stuff, right? They just think it's a really valuable experience, and they keep clamoring back for it. We think it's good for teaching, right? Um, we know that our students say, wow, we learned so much from this experience. It's unlike anything else we've ever done in school. Thank you. Can I have some more, right? Um, we know that it's good for recruiting, right? It sort of gets people excited about coming to the program when they see games that are out there and, and they get known and it makes it sort of a known commodity out there, right? Um, and to be honest, it's actually good for us as faculty, right? And so we're in this world now where you sort of have to justify your existence, not only at the university, but to the state. Like all sorts of people wonder, what is the value of education anymore? And we get to point at published student games and say, no, look, we're doing real stuff here, right? It's good, you know, it works out pretty well. One of the best reasons to do it, though, to be perfectly honest, is to avoid the cult of me, right? Um, one of the traps that faculty can run into is making disciples, right? Um, we have opinions, and our opinions really are always right. I mean, it's, it's kind of remarkable how correct we are. But, um, but you know, you, want, you don't want them to take your word for it. You want them to go out in the world and experience that for themselves. So when games go out and they get published, or when games get approved by industry advisory boards, it's not just you saying this was a good game. It's not just you saying this was a bad game, right? It's you're interacting with things outside of the classroom, and that changes it, right? We shouldn't want to make minions, right, as faculty members. We should be empowering people to go out there and make their own lives, right? Um, and so it's one of the reasons we do this kind of work that we do and the way we do it. Um, we think it's unprofessional to ship students in beta, right? We don't want to ship potential game developers. We want to ship game developers. And so when people graduate from our program, they have published games under their belt. They've mixed and mingled with industry professionals. They've run PR campaigns. They've cried and held each other, right? I mean, they know what it's like to be a game developer. Um, and so, you know, and, and, you know, and if we mess it up, we can always patch it later. We always have more schooling opportunities for them to come back and do additional things with us, right? So, um, 
I want to give uh, a couple of calls out there, just things that we can do. Um, so three totally unsolicited tips for things that we can do to get games with altitude, right? Games with altitude is this totally cool phrase that I've put out there that no one is ever going to repeat. But I think it's kind of a cool phrase for Utah, games with altitude, right? All right, so first, buy local and tell us what to stock. All right, so we have tons of students. And there are questions about, um, is there workforce in Utah to do all the digital media stuff that's out there? And the answer is, oh yeah, you better believe it, right? There are so many schools doing this kind of stuff and so many schools with proven success. And so you can let us know when you have QA jobs open and we will fill them with incredible people who are upwardly mobile that you want to be working with. When you want to offer internships, we can fill those internships for you in a heartbeat. And I would like to encourage you to think about offering more internships, right? Internships aren't just a chance to get labor done in your, uni in your, in, in your units, right, or in your company. It's also a chance to build the local community. It's a chance for you to put your stamp and teach a young adult about how games get made in your studio, right? And then that knowledge can travel around. There's nothing better than growing a talent pool for a community. And internships are actually one of the keys for that. There's also somewhat of a fear of hiring junior colleagues, right? And I want to help you get over that fear. Our graduate students aren't really junior colleagues. By the time they graduate and they get their first job, we frequently feel, hear back from employers that feels like they already have two or three years of experience, right? And it's because they've already made games and they've already been working with industry people. So it is like they have two or three years of experience. But even then, don't be afraid to take risk on, on junior employees, right? There's a lot of them out there, and that's how you're going to keep yourself fresh and keep your companies fresh as well. Oh, also, and you can straight up tell us what you need. That's the whole stocking part of this. If you need something, let us know, right? You just go ahead and talk to AJ or me or anybody, and, uh, and we'll happily take care of that for you. Um, research opportunities abound with us, right, and with all people in all universities. We work with lots of different companies on sponsored research projects. Um, we've done um, pretty close to, or if not over now, a million dollars of research with Rockwell Collins. This has led to new software that they're looking at commercializing. This has been a pipeline for them to get new uh, employees onboarded, and we've been able to show them different processes about how they can do their work. So they hired us to sort of compare um, game technology and simulation technology, and we presented with them all over the place on that. And it's changed the way that they've been seen, and it changes um, the way that uh, they interact with the local community. So, you know, it, we can solve vexing problems for you, we can prototype things, we do all sorts of work with people all the time. Um, so don't be afraid to call us if you want to take on a challenge together. We love working with you. And then finally, come to EAE Day, right? We love coming to UDEN, it is a fantastic thing. Come to EAE Day, see the students. It's like Switzerland, right? It's a safe place for everyone to mingle at the University of Utah. So, uh, and, and it's unbelievable how many people come and say, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you for 15 years. Imagine meeting you here, and it happens all around student games. Students love to hear your feedback, and you can give them all the opinions you want. Um, if you want to come, I highly recommend that you talk to AJ. He's back there by the camera, or you can email him. He's our industry relations fellow, and he'll talk to you about um, all sorts of fun stuff. All right. So that's me, and that's all I had to say for tonight. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, including the health of that poor alligator. <laughs> questions, comments, critiques, I'm moderately tough. Uh, that's the 27th of April, yeah, that's this month. So that's what, a week from today, yeah during the day. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a really good time. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally, right? So a lot of the principles and a lot of the ideas in film get used in games. And half of our degree uh, lives in the film department and half of it lives in computer science, right? Yeah. Yeah, oh, or games for that purpose. Yeah, games for education is a huge topic. And in fact, it goes all the way up to, well, like Obama has permanent staff now that are looking at games and education that work at the White House, right? So it, there are all sorts of grants in that area. And we actually have collaborated with the Natural History Museum to make a game to teach critical thinking skills to junior, junior high school students. It's a build your own dinosaur game called Dino Lab. 
Um, and it's a lot of fun. And so I think you're going to see more playful learning um, in the next coming years, right? Like Minecraft is going to be pretty much everyone's elementary school experience. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about serious games. So serious games or this notion of games with a purpose other than just entertainment um, are rapidly catching on. I think serious games sort of got a bad rap in the 80s, right, from a lot of the edutainment titles out there that may not have been as fun as people wanted them to, but many of them really were a lot of fun. Games like uh, Oregon Trail is something that everyone always talks about, right? And everyone remembers getting dysentery in that game, and it's kind of a, a fond memory for a lot of people who played games in the 80s. But um, if you go downstairs, on the way in, there was a game embedded in the benches. And it was a serious game. It's an educational game. It is a game that helps people who are five and under figure out what they want to see in the museum before they come in the museum. And then they can drag their parents to it. It's like a really simple BuzzFeed quiz for kids, right? And so it's like instead of which Game of Thrones character are you, it's what kind of scientist are you? And you smack some pretty things on a screen. It tells you what kind of scientist you are. And then it gives you a goal. Go find this giant crystal. Go find this particular dinosaur bone. And we actually have great studies that show when children lead families through uh, museum experiences that people learn more than when parents try and drag children through museum experiences, right? And so it's a game with a purpose. The game isn't educational per se, but it does uh, something very serious, right? It helps people get a better experience out of the museum. And we've done all sorts of games helping people who are disabled learn to ski again, um, people who um, are struggling with their own weight, like myself, um, learn better diet tips. Um, and we've done just a slew of these things, and uh, we are going to be doing more in the next coming years. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so gamification, so it's a topic that gets covered in our design classes. So we cover, we actually teach design to everyone. So we believe that designers can come from anywhere, from any discipline. And then any, everyone should learn design anyways. It'll make them better game developers. And gamification is one of the concepts that we cover, right? And definitely it's covered in our serious games kinds of things. Um, and gamification is complicated, right? It's almost, depending on the community you're in, some people love it, some people sort of question it, right? But it's definitely something we do in a lot of our serious games in our development as well. So, so yeah, if you're interested in that, I'd love to chat with you about it. Yeah. Yeah, please. I thought someone said, or I made it up in my brain, I don't know, but you said government and education is always looking for ways to validate how this is good and how it's going, what's happening. Yeah. How, what, what ways are they looking for to validate? What are their checkpoints? Okay. Yeah, no, that's, an excellent, that's an excellent question. So folks in the government are always interested in things like, um, well, I'll give you a great example. The project that I'm working on with the Natural History Museum a fair amount of its funding comes from workforce education. And the idea that a lot of employers have complained that their employees don't have critical thinking skills, right? And so we have this game, and the government is one to sponsor that game because it teaches critical thinking skills. But one of the things they want to know is, what are people doing with these degrees? There was a critique years ago about a degree to nowhere, and that meme has really stuck around, right? And so people ask, what are you actually learning when you learn these things? And while we know hard skills are important, things like art and programming and all that, we also know that without soft skills, you have pretty short careers, right? And so we are all about combining all those things, the enrichment piece, the soft skills piece, and the hard skills piece. And that's why we keep track of things like how many people are being employed. You know, previously, we may not have even cared about that. We would just say, okay, hey, you're educated now, go off and live your lives. But when people ask you, where do people work, we need to be able to answer that now. It's yeah. a good question. Anything else anyone wants to know? Yeah, Jeff. Yes. That is an excellent question. So the question is, how has Utah helped us build this program? I don't know that we could have built it anywhere else the way that we built it, right? So Utah was a perfect mixture of lots of things. There's a great game dev history here and a lot of cool companies here on a fairly small location. Um, there's this great history of graphics being developed here. Um, you know, the founder of Atari is a Utah alumni. So there's always all these ingredients sort of percolating. But I tell you what really helped things out is Utah is a place that rewards entrepreneurialism, right? And we bootstrapped this program. When we started this program, we did it at a cost of zero to the University of Utah. We took no startup funds, and instead we said, hey, look, if students are willing to pay to do this thing and they're new students, let us spend that money on them. 
That proposal would not have worked at most universities. But Utah's government, Utah's culture, Utah's business rewards entrepreneurialism. So they said, look, if you're willing to take that risk and you can make it work, go for it. And we realized that partner was really the key to that. So we partnered with all of our local industry people. Many of the people in this room gave us a ton of help. Um, and we were able to pull it off. And um, yeah, I, I don't know that we could have done it without huge capital investment in other systems. And I don't know that anyone would have given you that in 2007. So yeah, the entrepreneurial spirit of Utah, right? Yeah, and you're, you're gonna be hearing just a ton about this in the next couple of years. So um, medicine is really interested in games, right? Because we now know that games do things with the brain that film and reading don't do, right? That the mind is alive when you're playing games. And we have all these great studies like your pain tolerance is increased when you're playing a game as opposed to watching a movie. So there's like these virtual reality games that they give people who are getting burn treatments now and they request less morphine when they're using this VR game experience versus watching a movie in VR or listening to music or reading a book, right? And so, and so it's, a, it's kind of an incredible thing. And so we know that, um, and we know that we can use games to teach people things very, very rapidly, very concept, or very difficult concepts can be learned through games pretty quickly because you get to play with ideas. Right, so your whole life you learned through play, right? And the way you stayed healthy, both in terms of your body and your mind, was play, right? And we've got a culture that sort of said, after you're 18, stop playing, right? It's time to work now and it's time to grow up. And people are now pushing against that. And a lot of those folks are in medicine. So uh, the University of Utah School of Medicine, they came to us saying, we really wanna double down on games and play and health and see what we can do to change people's lives. Um, and that's happening all over the nation. So, so that's the Gap Lab, a therapeutic games and apps lab. Um, it's, it runs every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We give Tuesdays and Thursdays for students to try and cram in order to mount some learning in that short time. But so yeah, so come any Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we'll give you a tour and show you all the stuff that we do. We got all sorts of great toys. Yeah, so that's a good question. So this question of, is there a way to sort of seamlessly pass through? The, the biggest way that we have, to be honest, is the man standing over there, AJ, right? So AJ is in touch with all of our local industry people. And so we do get calls, you know, someone calls us in April and says, hey, I'm going to be needing to hire someone that looks like this. We probably have someone who looks like that there, right? So we've had industry people come to us and ask about publishing our games, but we haven't done a partnership yet in that sense, where we've had either... Um, formally a local company or a publisher collaborate with our games while they're in school. People who've graduated have gone on to start their own companies and then work with folks to publish their games and have received some seed funding and things like that to do that, but not through the university per se just yet, right? But we keep pretty tight uh, relationships with industry. It's pretty important to us. And so while it's not, um, there's no schedule about how to get people directly there, um, we definitely just make sure that the phone lines are always open, right? Yeah. That's an excellent question. We teach one class, I believe, in games and music. Um, and the reason for that is because of the way games gets done traditionally uh, with music, right? So most of that gets outsourced. And so there are all these great music production studios that do music for games and movies and film. And so those folk tend to come from, game, from music schools more than from game schools, right? So they come from some MFA program and they end up in those places. And so even in a good sized studio, you might only have one sound person even though you have 150, 160 people in that studio, right? That being said, um, we have to take another look at that because of uh, indie games and the rise of small teams needing to do their own music. The way we handle it, a lot of partnering with music students, right? Some people have friends that are musicians that are outside. Um, we have a... Uh, we have a sound booth, but we're out of space, so we put somebody in it into their office now. It's the quietest office on campus. It's kind of nice, yeah. Is that time, or should we go? Yeah, is there another question? Someone can ask a mean question. Those are always fun. Yeah. 
That's an, that's an excellent question. So uh, the question was, um, do we teach them game engines or do we teach them programming? Um, the answer to that is we kind of teach them programming. Um, we're really technology agnostic is the pat answer, right? We use the right tool for the right job. And we want the students to be able to see what the right tool is and choose to use that tool. But like in, in our undergraduate program, the programmers learn, they're going through a traditional CS degree. So they might start with Java or Python and then move on to C++ and move on to C Sharp and move on to all the things, software engineering, you know, and data structures and all that kind of fun stuff, traditional CS stuff. In our graduate program, the programmers already have programming experience. And so a lot of what it is is helping them deepen their existing knowledge and also learning some of that software engineering, best practice -y kind of stuff. And like the real dirty secret is we don't really teach a whole lot in the graduate program, right? What we do is we give them a lot of opportunities. And so we give them opportunities to learn things and we help coach them to learn those things because we want them to be able to do it when they leave, right? So we'll teach them all sorts of tips and tricks and things like that. But a lot of the learning is informal, but very dedicated and informal. So we help them learn what they need to do to accomplish tasks at hand because um, we want them to be lifelong learners. Um, like John said at the beginning, we're all about making innovators. We don't want to make tomorrow's workforce. We want to make tomorrow's, the day after tomorrow's leaders, right? So while our students are ready to work, right, they're also ready to move up the ranks and they're not going to wash out very soon. Or so we believe. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.